That's great. John, you've been busy. Oh, well, well yeah, it, it's amazing. The COVID stuff has, has really, you know, you never want to let, let a good crisis go to waste, Rob. Because you can always let you do things you never get a chance to do other audio. Do you want to go do visual? Okay. Broken up. I saw him. I see you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, 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 someone has a doggy. <laughs> Martha, Martha's on. Great. Okay. All right. Well, hi, folks. Um, so, so great to be joined by so many folks. Thanks for your patience this evening as we navigate the wonderful world of Zoom, Facebook Live, and all the rest of it. Um, so I think we'll just get started. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself and share a little bit about Happy City and Jane's Walks, and then I'll pass it over to John and Heather and Rob to introduce themselves. Um, we'll get started with a bit of a video, um, which I'm really excited to watch now for the second time. Um, Martha, would you mind muting there? <laughs> Pardon me? Would you mind just pressing mute? Uh, yes, I know the dog. I, I'm trying to do that. Okay. <laughs> Dogs are always welcome. <laughs> on the dog. I'm glad it's not mine for a change. <laughs> if my two hear more barking, they're likely to barge into the room and jump all over me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Demanding treats. Demanding treats. That's awesome. I, I don't know how to unmute this. Andrew? <laughs> I'm sorry. I am so, so sorry. No, you're no problem. It. We're, we're glad you're, you're here, Martha. It's great great to hear from you. It's so yeah. nice to see you again. Uh, can you either put Bruce in the backyard or put yeah. this on mute? I don't know how to put it on mute. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there you are. Um, okay, perfect. So um, my name is Jen and I'm with Happy City St. John's. For those of you who aren't familiar with Happy City, we're a nonprofit organization focused on enc encouraging civic dialogue and informing residents specifically on municipal issues. So you'll most frequently see us doing live tweets of city council meetings on Twitter if that's where you hang out. Um, otherwise, we try to, wherever possible, um, offer opportunities for people to come together and talk about shared issues um, and in some cases celebrate shared things and that's exactly why we are here this evening um, thinking about how do we make our city a better place to be and that's really the idea behind Jane's Walks. Um, so Happy City St. John's for the past seven or eight years has been um, leading Jane's Walks in St. John's which is a annual um, walking, running, scooting festival um, that happens across the world in cities across the world. And it's in memory of Jane Jacobs and in commemoration of her vision around what it means to be in a city, what it means to create accessible cities, and ultimately how um, we can together build better cities that are for more people. Um, so in the spirit of Jane's Walks, we've been doing several different online walks um, of course, due to COVID-19, everything's been happening virtually. So we have, um, you know, we have storybook PDFs, we have pre-recorded videos, um, we have children doing Jane's Walks, we have seniors doing Jane's Walks and everyone in between. Um, so I'd encourage folks to check out happycity.ca if you're, if this is the kind of thing that you're into, um, there's many more where this came from. So I think with that, I'll pass it over to John to get us started with some introductions of both himself and the team, and then we'll get going with the video. Thanks, Jan. So my name is John Fitzgerald, and I'm the executive director of the Basilica Heritage Foundation, which is to say we are not the Archdiocese of St. John's of the Roman Catholic Church. We are a registered Canadian charity, a volunteer board um, that has as its goal the restoration and preservation of the Basilica Cathedral of St. John's and its contents and its associated buildings and their contents and their contents as a National Historic Site of Canada. So I'm a historian. I have a background in Newfoundland and Labrador history. Um, and we, we, I came to the Basilica Foundation initially three years ago oh. as the chair. And I got it. after I was chair, um, we had a lot, of, we did a lot of work, raised a lot of funds, and they asked me to become executive director, which is, which is fine. So I got busy with that. 
we quickly discovered that this church in particular and the churches in the district were getting a lot of tourists. And I mean, 35,000 tourists during a tourism season in addition to regular congregations. And they weren't just going to the Basilica, they were going to other churches in downtown St. John's. We began talking with the other churches and they began talking with us and we discovered we have a lot in common. And we also realized that we're the National Historic District of something known as the Ecclesiastical District of St. John's. What happened was, oh, about, I suppose, 2006, 2008, the Heritage Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador and the city of St. John's nominated our district. And that's 61 acres of land in the middle of Heritage Area 1 in downtown St. John's and a whole bunch of buildings and a whole bunch of national historic persons to become a national historic district of Canada, which is the highest grade of, of heritage conservation designated. Oh, thank you, Can I ask so you? We, we actually... Um, we got together and um, we, we started to form a working group. So my fellow members of the working group, um, some of them are here tonight. So I, on one side of me here is Heather McClellan from the Kirk and Robert Pitt from Gower Street United. So um, I don't know if that's sort of a, a, a bit of an introduction. I guess you also asked, what about this topic is important? And maybe Jen, you asked as well, me to speak a little bit or one of us to speak about what might we expect to see in this video. Um, maybe Heather would like to have a, a word about that. What about our, what is it about our ecclesiastical district that's important, Heather? You can, you can tell folks. Well, uh, we were designated in 2008 by the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada to be a, a, a district of national historic importance. And they saw the historical importance of the role of the four churches in the development of St. John's. And in particular, uh, they identified they played a very important role in the educational, uh, the social, charity, uh, political, economic, and religious development, and, and in a very unique way. Uh, real um, development forces, and at a time, early times, that was before there was actually a state. So a very unique coming together uh, of growing a, 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 new, a, new, a new colony, uh, growing a new place in the new world, and they were instrumental in making that happen. So we're going to share what was created by the citizens over 300 years uh, as part of these congregations. Um, I guess the other thing, I, I'll pitch this one over to Rob, because Jen, you asked, well, what can we expect to see in this video? So maybe Rob can speak to that a bit. Uh, thanks. Uh, you'll see a, a number of uh, still images uh, of, the, uh, of the churches in the Ecclesiastical District, which are the uh, St. Andrews uh, Presbyterian, the Kirk, the Basilica, Cathedral of St. John the Baptist the Anglican Cathedral of St. John the Baptist and Gower Street United Church, uh, which began as Gower Street Methodist Church, but in 1925, uh, as, as you'll see in the uh, video, uh, became part of the United Church of Canada. Uh, before uh, Newfoundland and Labrador were part of Canada. And it's been suggested by historians, social historians, that in fact, that uh, connection with Canada, it certainly wasn't the only one, might have had a, um, an important role to play in the decision by our, uh, our fellow Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to, uh, to let Canada join us in 1949. Uh, anyway, I'll leave that to the, to the other social historians, but you'll see the still images of these buildings. But of course, when you get the opportunity, you, you must do an actual walk and see them in the, in the flesh or the plaster or the wood and the brick uh, as well. So one thing just to preface our little video with, it, it runs about 22 minutes. The first couple of minutes are me talking and I may actually just keep talking here because we've had a little issue with the sound. We're trying to bring the level up a bit on the recording, but the recording, if you can go to it, we'll have the link if you wanna go and watch it on, on YouTube. 
uh, after this, if you want to view it again or check something out. But through this medium here with Zoom, the sound may be down a little bit. So we'll, we'll just try to keep speaking and, and talk about it and talk to the video and speak to what some of the pictures are showing. It moves, uh, it moves at, a, as a, at a reasonable clip and we try to keep it moving. So once we get to the, about the four minute mark, I'll sort of shut up and then we'll let the video carry on. But if we have trouble with sound, we'll pop in. How about that? That sounds great. Okay. John, great. do you want me to share my screen there now or would you like to kind of do a bit of a preamble and then I can share it at the four minute mark? Um, you can share your screen and um, I guess, uh, will I be able to keep uh, speaking there or will we let yeah, the video? Absolutely. Let's see how, yeah, let's see if we can hear the video. Okay. And we might just want to wind that back to the beginning and press play. This is a presentation about the downtown St. John's Ecclesiastical District. And we really have views of the district here. And I have with me three guests. I have so you might have a little difficulty hearing what we're saying there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're, I'm just introducing that we have Ann Walsh, who is the chair of our foundation, the Basilica. We have Heather and Rob Pitt here. And this really is a, a slideshow. Um, and the idea here is that there are a lot of people who pass by these buildings and in this district on a daily basis and who may not know what it is they're walking past or driving past. So you can, you can let it play. Church Heritage and Archives. My name is John Fitzgerald and we're going to take you on a tour of this district. Um, I guess the first thing to say is that in the early 2000s, the four churches of the Ecclesiastical District, Gower Street, the Kirk, the Anglican Cathedral, and the Basilica, were nominated by the Heritage Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador and the City of St. John's to become a National Historic District of Canada. The district was designated in 2008. And National Historic District status is the highest grade of heritage designation in Canada. Um, and in fact, it, it's unique in all of Canada and in its situation. And it also is more than just the sum of its parts. It's an exceptional district. Um, it and so Jen, I'm just gonna speak over this if you, if you can let me for a second. I'm yeah, saying, absolutely. That, yeah, so this is, um, it's an exceptional part of, of Canada, an exceptional part of our history and, and our city. And it's a really unique historical district that is without equal anywhere in Canada. And it's, we, we, we're very fortunate in this province. We have national historic districts like we have Bonavista and we have the Rennies Mill Road District in St. John's, but this is on a scale unseen anywhere else in, in Canada. These are the two plaques that, are, that mark the district for the Historic Sites and Monuments Board. And they're down on the wall of the, uh, the graveyard across from the courthouse on Duckworth Street. So you can just let this play for a second. of the Newfoundland and Labrador peoples since the 1690s and perhaps even earlier. Some of these institutions are older than the oldest institutions of the state itself. Um, the peoples who came to Newfoundland and Labrador came to fish and they built their churches um, in this place, but they really were here to pursue the international cod fishery, the grand cod fishery of the universe. And it was the fishery that gave rise to settlement. And the picture is taken from the site of the, one of the... So just to narrate a little bit again here, uh, I took this picture from the bottom of the Anglican Cathedral Cemetery, and it shows the cathedral, but it shows the graveyard. That graveyard contains 5,000 burials, at least. And the significant thing is they weren't all Anglican. They were people of every faith, and some have no faith, but many of the ancestors of people who fished in, in Newfoundland are buried in that graveyard. And the, the Anglican Cathedral has a number, of, a number of previous churches that were on that site near this monument. And you're gonna see shortly, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna see that there are other monuments here. Many of them are, are national historic significance because there are some nationally historic people buried in here. Um, okay, you can keep playing. 
we see people um, and, and commemorated in this district, throughout the district, as persons of national historic significance, like William Parsons. We also see a variety of cemeteries throughout this district. The old Roman Catholic Cemetery, the Forgotten Graveyard, which is in front of the turf um, on Long's Hill. And we see, of course, the Neo-Gothic, the beautiful Neo-Gothic Cathedral, the Anglican Cathedral of St. John the Baptist, which was built and burned and built and burned. Um, but the one after the 1892 fire remained. And it is a national historic site as well. Builder of Bowles, a person of national historic significance. It is gorgeous inside. It's, uh, it's Neo-Gothic in style. It has incredible um, architecture, beautiful Lancet neo-Gothic windows, and um, a, a huge pipe organ. And those windows um, are, are a recurring motif in all our churches, these artworks. They're some of the most precious artworks that we have. Um, the cathedral has tent windows, um, and it, it, has, it has some incredible images um, of, of uh, the best artists of the age when these buildings were built. Um, even in the cathedral, um, you see incredible statuary. You see the treasures of Newfoundland and Labrador, like the Prince Henry communion set from 1786. And uh, next door, of course, the manse house and the bishop's house across from the cathedral. So there are other properties in, in, in the district. And um, again, more cemeteries. We see even more cemeteries, even Roman Catholic cemetery up back the other side. Of the One of the things I've done here, Jan, is uh, I've sort of put things in chronological order. This is probably where um, the low volume ends. So Heather is going to speak right now about the Kirk in the recording, and the volume is going to come up. So people who've been complaining about the bad audio will be able to hear it a bit better. So if you press play, we'll let it run. St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church really represents the Scottish immigrants who came to Newfoundland to participate in the economy that resulted in our immense fishery. And they didn't come as fishermen. They started to come around 1840 in great numbers. And they came as merchants, experienced merchants, and skilled craftspeople and professionals, such as masons and engineers. They wanted to be part of the economy in the New World, and most people would probably recognize names like Sir Robert Reed, who came and built the railway and then managed the coastal boat service throughout the province. They would probably know names such as James Beard, and uh, uh, who Beard still own today, the premises on Water Street where the family started uh, in uh, the mid-1800s. And other names such as Templetons, and Munns, and, El and Eltons, uh, these were all the business families. So they were very committed to their life and their heritage coming from Scotland. And so they built their church, bringing, this was the fourth church that uh, the Presbyterians had built. The one that had built, uh, we see today uh, was built after the Great Fire. And they brought brick with them. They, they brought brick over from Scotland. They brought the limestone over from Scotland. And they brought the Ballantine stained glass windows from Scotland. James Ballantine. Uh, was one of the United Kingdom's uh, master skilled uh, stained glass maker. Uh, he helped bring back stained glass work to churches in the United Kingdom in the 1800s as they had been banned uh, uh, in around the 1500s. The collection we have here at uh, Kirk is considered not only the best in North America of his work, but perhaps the best in the world. And uh, Mr. Ballantine used to come from Scotland with the windows and then his son. And he, he is responsible for our memorial window. And of course, our memorial window pays homage to the Highlanders who were the youth, uh, Scottish youth who participated 
uh, in the First World War, were a part of the first, uh, first 500, which was really made up of all the youth groups from the four churches, the first 500, and uh, the symbol, the caribou, which was the symbol of the Highlanders, was adopted as the symbol of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. And of course, today we know of the caribous that are in Europe. So, you know, our identity is directly linked to this, to our district. Gower Street United Church uh, was uh, the building that we see today, uh, built by Elijah Houle, an important uh, 19th century uh, British architect, is the fourth uh, church of the, uh, of the congregation. The Gower Street Congregation, which was founded in 1815, is the oldest in the city. There had been some congregations founded in the decades before in the outports. And it came to the city in about 1815, and when the first church building was, uh, was erected to the uh, east of where the present site is. Uh, fire the following year uh, uh, destroyed the chapel, and a new chapel was moved here in the current site to avoid future fires, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, w was successful. That strategy was successful until, uh, until uh, 1892 when t fire destroyed again the third church on the site or, or, uh, of the congregation and much of the other city. Uh, this building you see today is uh, unique. It's a, uh, a Romanesque with uh, Gothic and other elements. Uh, Houle designed this. It's only the second uh, example of Houle's work in North America. Uh, it has a, uh, three levels of, uh, of seating inside, uh, a unique hammer beam uh, ceiling and work around the sides. Uh, when you go into the church, have a look up, and uh, you can see all of the work that's done in, uh, in wood there and, and around the sanctuary itself. Uh, the church has, uh, in more recent uh, decades, has uh, installed uh, many uh, uh, interesting uh, artistic, locally done uh, stained glass windows. Originally, the church had uh, plain windows, which was the Methodist style. It was founded as a Methodist congregation, and then in 1925, it became part of the United Church of Canada. A, uh, an ecumenical uh, uh, merging of Congregationalists some Presbyterians and Methodists uh, to form the United Church of Canada and Bermuda. Uh, to the uh, west of the, uh, the current site is another one of those uh, hidden graveyards in what is now uh, perhaps covered by uh, the memorial building of Gower, which was built later on, and, uh, and the park and, and uh, street to the west. And so what you see on the slide in front of you is the Roman Catholic Basilica of St. John the Baptist, not to be confused with the Anglican Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. This is the second Roman Catholic church in the city. The first was a wooden chapel on Henry Street, built around 1786. And this uh, building that you see here, the Basilica, began construction around 1843 and uh, was consecrated in 1855. It's a massive building, seats about 2,000, and it's uh, largely, I guess we characterize it as neo-Romanesque architecture. You'll see the stunning ceiling, which catches everybody and kind of lifts their attention upward. This began as a white plaster, a flat white plaster ceiling in 1855. It was coffered in 1905, and it was uh, polychromed in 1955 on the 100th anniversary of its consecration. Uh, all of that that you see in front of you is plaster, and it's plaster done by generations of one family, the Conways, who mm -hmm. came to Newfoundland and Labrador uh, in the 1850s at Bishop Fleming's request to help build the basilica, so they were stonemasons, and they quickly turned their hand, as they said, to plaster, and you can see the intricacy of the plaster work there. Bishop Fleming was the, the builder of the basilica as well as the person who invited the presentation and the Mercy Sisters to Newfoundland. And he's also a person of national historic significance. Um, in his last will and testament, he left funds to 
purchase a statue called The Dead Christ by John Hogan, who was a very <coughs> who had studied in Rome. And there are several other marble versions of this and a plaster version of this, but they're all in Ireland. This is the only North American version. Um, as with the other churches, um, these, these cathedrals are cultural sites, heritage sites, and, and um, the Symphony Orchestra, for example, comes in every Christmas and does Handel's Messiah. So it's a community event that, that people, um, people very much are aware of. The acoustics in all of these buildings are stunning. Uh, we like to think that although the denominations and the particular congregations hold title to these properties, in a way they're the patrimony of everybody in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. They're cultural properties that in a way belong to everybody. And if you look at this building, if you've seen the Da Vinci Code, you've seen this building. This is uh, the American Embassy in Paris. No, it's not. It's the Roman Catholic Bishop's residence built around 1923 after a fire, you guessed it, a fire that destroyed the previous Bishop's residence. And uh, who was asked to design the, the new residence but uh, Delano and Aldrich, two American architects who were at work already in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, with the King George V Institute. They also worked on the cottage hospitals at Newfoundland's coast and, and inland. And here they built this building and when they were asked to uh, design the American Embassy in Paris, they just said, here, we got a better one, and gave them that. So we're very proud of this building, actually. It's a lovely palatial, uh, but also uh, it's stately and homey. Uh, it's no longer a residence, it's the offices for the Archdiocese of St. John's. And you can see the gates in front of the building in the lower right-hand corner. You have a family connection to this. I do. Uh, my great-great-grandfather and his son, who came from Scotland but were Irish immigrants to Glasgow, uh, came out here and uh, started one of, these, uh, one of the first foundries to do fancy work, they called it. And there's an example of their work. And uh, every time I pass it, I feel like I'm connected to my past. A wrought iron fence and fence posts. Yeah. Good stuff. It's, it's all part of a district. And, of course, behind this is the Bishop's Library, the Episcopal Library, and the old St. Bonaventure's College, and then the new St. Bonaventure's College. In the library, um, which, again, dates from the 1850s, this one is, is, is set up uh, for a special event. You can tell us about that. Once a year, uh, we host in, in that library. We run it as a museum, in fact, in the summer. It was always meant to be um, a cultural meeting place. There were operas held there in the 1890s. Now, if you look at this room, this has an occupancy permit of 49 people. But we have a record of 800 people in the opera there. So that was before fire departments were invented. And this uh, is our, our nativity display, which we mount every year outside of COVID time and welcome people of all cultures to come and see how the, that birth of Christ scene is depicted in their culture. Also, if you went through the neighborhood, you'd see all kinds of statues like these ones by John Edward Carew, um, especially the Immaculate Conception. There are some on the steps. People who might have been to London, England will remember Trafalgar Square and the death of Nelson and Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square by John Edward Carew. So the, the artworks that we have in this city are incredible. And it, 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 points to, um, it points to the tourism potential as well of this district, the incredible um, draw and attraction that visitors have to the kinds of things they're going to see in this district. What fascinates me is that although the Scottish immigrants brought Scottish brick and the Irish immigrants built the basilica out of stone from Greg Namana uh, or Galway, uh, what they did here was something different. They didn't just recreate home. They made a statement that this was their new place and it's a place to stay. So what you see here are immigrant populations staking their claim on a new way of being, a new way of building culture, and a new way of being together in this new home. Um, it, it's interesting. We also have lost buildings that were in this district, but one of them here we see is the, the Church of England Parish Hall by John Pearson. Uh, another building we haven't lost is the old Benevolent Irish Society, also by John Pearson. 
But when you look at the international connections of these architects, um, Pearson went on to design another building, and he seems to have had practice in St. John's. Did it have a tower? Did it have a tower? Yes, it did. And so um, now you know where he got to practice the first couple of times before he before he did build this thing. Um, also in the district, we have convents. Uh, we have presentation convents. Uh, we have the school, which is now the generally. And of course, there are there are other things. The, the sisters um, are, are the custodians of, which are the treasures of Newfoundland and Labrador, things like the Vale of Virgin um, and their home village chapel, which are absolutely stunning and draw visitors to the district by the tens of thousands. Several of the windows that you'll see in that chapel uh, actually were made by William Warrington. And so if you watched Harry and Meghan's wedding at St. George's Chapel in Windsor, you saw Warrington windows. And if you come to the Basilica, you'll see seven more Warrington windows. That, those two places, Presentation Convent and the Basilica, make that the largest collection of Warrington windows outside of St. George's Chapel. And, you know, we have more cemeteries. And um, it, it, it's a remarkable sort of neighborhood that has a life over the last two and a half centuries. Um, and, and another convent, we have Mercy Convent, we have their Oratory Chapel, and it, it, interesting, this one really dates from the 1890s after the fire, again in a, in a, a neoclassical style, but the windows by Lion of Toronto, and where are the most Lion windows found in Canada, but in the Parliament buildings in Ottawa. So there are things in this district which are incredible. The cultural connections, Robert, to, to, to speak about it for a second, I mean, you can, you can talk about kinds of things that go on in these churches. Well, the, uh, the, the churches are, of course, uh, more than uh, places of, uh, of worship. Uh, they are uh, cultural centers for, uh, for the arts, uh, apart from the art that is built into the, to many of the buildings and the windows and the architectural design. There's the, uh, the uh, great opportunities uh, for music, for uh, other performances uh, as well. Uh, and one of the things that I find in walking around the district is, is the, the integrity of these pieces, uh, except with a few exceptions. Uh, I saw an example of the parish hall that was again to a fire. Uh, the area, if you, if you did a circle around these, uh, the four churches we've been talking about, uh, you have an area that remains much the same as when they were built, at least the last iterations of the building. Uh, without terrible intrusions. So it has maintained its architectural, its cultural integrity, which is something that we have to con try to continue to maintain, not just uh, because we respect the past, but because we have hopes for the future enjoyment that we owe to all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and all Canadians. Heather, one of the things that we're looking forward to doing in the district is trying to make this a World Heritage Site. Uh, and in fact, maybe you can talk for a second about that and the importance of that and how people who are watching this can maybe help us. Yes, uh, we can demonstrate here just how important uh, our collection of buildings, our architects, our stories, our art, the unique role that <coughs> the early immigrants to North America played in building the district. And we have strong, strong feelings that we would be a strong candidate site for a World Heritage designation. The former head of UNESCO World Heritage has met with us and has encouraged us to go forward with an application. And I, what's important is that religious sites is the largest type of designation in UNESCO because religions, you know, whether they're ancient, right to present, shape cultures, societies. So we're very excited about uh, this opportunity, uh, continuing to explore its feasibility. We need the city as a partner. We look forward to that. And if you think that the city of St. John's should protect the district and help make it a World Heritage Site, please contact the mayor. The other thing to remind everyone watching is that when the COVID restrictions lift, 
everyone is most welcome to visit this district. And you can check out the individual churches at some of these websites. Uh, you can also send an email to the, the, the email address on the previous screen, and we can make sure it gets to the right place. Um, and I guess I'd like to, to thank you, um, Heather and Robert, for coming and, and speaking to us today. And um, I thank everyone for watching, because this is an exciting heritage, and it, it has an exciting future. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I hope you can, um, I hope you, even though that the audio was low on it, and again, we're playing a YouTube video and we're playing it over Zoom and then it's coming back to you. So it, 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 was, it was lower than, than you'd hear it even if you went to YouTube. And we'll have the link for people who want to go. But I think that even the pictures, Jen, would, would sort of show you that we have some incredible stuff to offer in that district. And this is, this is National Historic Site. In fact, we believe it's, we've been told to believe it's World Heritage Site class material. And that would have an enormous impact on our tourism economy. Just to remind people, in the last year during COVID, we have seen a billion and a half dollars disappear out of our provincial tourism economy. This would be an incredible incentive for tourism to resume. And it would be a tremendous draw when it's safe to come back, when everyone has their two shots, when, when, when uh, people feel comfortable. Um, this would be an incredible asset for us to to look into. So Destination St. John's is looking at this um, and uh, the province is interested in this. Uh, the Heritage Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador are going to meet with us shortly. So we have, we have lots, of, uh, lots of potential partners here and lots of, we have lots of work to do, but we have, we have, we've had some great encouragement. This is fantastic, John. This, um, and congratulations, Heather, John, and Rob um, for pulling together such a brilliant video. I think this is so incredibly informative. I know I was like rapidly taking notes um, as we went. I certainly learned a lot, um, but I wanted to open up if folks have questions or maybe there were pieces that you're like, oh, I saw the photo, but I couldn't quite hear. Um, perfect opportunity to ask the experts to, to elaborate on some of what you saw. Um, so just open it up now for any questions and feel free to unmute yourself um, and just chime in. I'll bet you Rob White has a question. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've been biting my tongue off. Um, first of all, that video, wow, that was so, so informative and in a really nice, light manner. Um, you know, 35,000 visitors, uh, what a great, great, tangible, uh, definite interest in the, in the district. To have those numbers you know that's only the beginning guys that's only the very very beginning that shows you right there uh, as to how much of an interest there is in the district and what wonderful potential i've made notes too jen um you know i lead tours and uh, expeditions um to different parts of the world for a private american company and i that's what i did for 15 years before COVID. and i can tell you that the when we tour um all over the world um the architectural, cultural, historical, and, and I wanna say artistic components of the ecclesiastical district uh, are not to be underestimated. And, you know, each of these provide a really, I think, compelling and real link to um, our history, of course, um, but also the very fabric of what makes Newfoundland and Labrador, Newfoundland and Labrador. And, you know, those connections to Europe, the history of the family uh, connection, the, the People love hearing stories about how things were built, how sites were built, and and not just for the religious, but the again the architectural and other components here. There, there, there is a lot of that here. Um, you know, I think people would find it fascinating. Uh, they love connections to famous movies. People love that on tour. So the fact that uh, there's that Da Vinci Code um, connection, I think I already know people will be very very interested in that. Um, the Veiled Virgin, uh, I'm still waiting to see it in person and I'm looking very forward to that day, but I will say that the, again, this adds a, an artistic component, you know, it's not just, it's, again, it's so 
beyond lovely, isn't it? I mean, for the way it was created and the way it was just be stunning, uh, the photos I've seen, because of the rarity and the beauty, people will be into that too. So the acoustics of the building, um, I heard of, and um, in the video, of course, but can you imagine that a group uh, of paying people who are coming to learn and they, of course, UNESCO World Heritage Site, it's all about learning, right? And the different, a whole series of different ways. But can you imagine a site such as yours um, with a group of people coming in and someone being delighted by a surprise performance and a cappella in any of the, I promise you, it would make such an incredible impact and a memory. Um, you know, I think it's, incredible potential and I would love to be taking groups of people through the district at some point. Um, I've learned a lot from the video and I look forward to learning more but I I think it's uh, superb and I commend everybody for their efforts because UNESCO has a um, not just a cachet but an actual um, it's a, a pax of wallop you know UNESCO it's, uh, it's phenomenal I wish you all the, all the best I, I think it's a wonderful wonderful place. Thank you. Rob, in some ways, you know, the UNESCO brand is the, it's the gold, it's the platinum. It is. Really, right? Is. For is. to certify that you are, you have the highest level of protection of a heritage resource and that this, this, this resource is going to be protected, conserved and interpreted for people um, at a level that is world class. And uh, it just, just to, you know, just to think about this UNESCO thing for a second. We all know the pyramids, right? We all know the Eiffel Tower. We all know Notre Dame Cathedral, right? We all know, you know, but hey, there's also the Sydney Opera House built in 1970, right? There's age does not have to do with world heritage. Something no. can be ancient, something can be modern. The real question is, how is this unique and how is this, um, how is this a, a, a time changing event? In the case of Sydney Opera House, it was that architect, Ob Arab, who began pouring concrete in these incredible forms, these sort of, you know, mollusk shells, uh, mollusk, mollusk shells. Um, we tend to forget that he's also the guy who poured the, uh, the pedestrian footbridge in Barring Park. And when he received a medal for his lifelong achievement in architecture from the British Society of Architects, the gold medal, they asked him what was his most important architecture. And he said, he said two things. He said, of course, the Sydney Opera House. And he said, the pedestrian footbridge in St. John's, Newfoundland. Wow. <laughs> if you look That's at cool. it, it's designed like an elephant with its long trunk spanning what was the so this stuff is around us, and we're absolutely gifted to have these kinds of heritage assets in this city. Um, there's, a, there's an element as well of threat. Uh, there's an element of urgency to needing to preserve these things. We have at the moment a city council that's having a discussion about a condo tower downtown in the middle of our district. We're very concerned about that. And we've asked for meetings with the mayor um, we, we are waiting, we're waiting to hear, and there's a municipal election coming. And, um, you know, th these are going to be issues I think that you'll hear more about. Um, there's gonna be, there's gonna be some discussion, but I don't want that to take away from, as Rob said, you know, the, the world-class nature of, 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 of these, these buildings. This also, um, I mean, Heather, just, just tell us the story. I, I, I always look, I look to the Kirk in some ways. It's interesting. We find ourselves telling each other stories, but I look to the Kirk and, and the Ballantyne windows and especially the ones in memory of the Scots Highlanders. Heather, you got to tell that story and how that defines Newfoundland and Labrador. Well, um, certainly uh, I believe the youth core groups, uh, whether it was the Methodist Guard, whether it was the Catholic core, whether it was the uh, Church Lads Brigade and then the Scottish Highlanders, they made up 480 of the 500, the first 500. And um, in World War One, so, yeah. in World War One. And so one of those Highlanders 
uh, was a war mate with uh, James Ballantine's son in Scotland because the Scottish regiment uh, and the Newfoundland regiment worked together and they became good friends. And so because the Ballantine family had done the earlier windows, uh, when uh, this young man, his name was Thomas, and his family was, um, uh, I think perhaps went on to be Thomas Glass. And I don't know if there's a connection there, but uh, when he died, uh, Mr. Ballantine was more than pleased to be able to do the, the memorial window for the Highlanders. Um, so, uh, you know, here we have like so the finest crafts person in, in all of the United Kingdom working on windows in a Scottish church in St. John's, Newfoundland. And uh, all of his works now, because he's an icon in Scotland, much like Bobby Burns. He was a writer. Um, he was a poet. Uh, he was an artist. He went to the University of Edinburgh. And all of his cre you know, creative works are at the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and is considered uh, a great artist. So when you look at the architects, like we had talked about Pearson building the, the, um, the parish hall. And, you know, he really did test learning how to do towers in our district and went on to, to do the Peace Tower and considered one of Canada's greatest architects. Um, the uh, architect who did our church, our church is uh, uh, Willis. I mean, he, he was a Gothic architect uh, from uh, England and Scotland. And Gothic uh, Scottish architecture is different than English Gothic architecture. And, um, you know, so we, and we had Sir, Sir Gilbert Scott design, you know, this great architecture of the Anglican Cathedral, uh, considered the best Gothic architect in the world. So, you know, we have such, we, we came, this was developed at a time when, um, the immigrants were proud of, of, of their culture they came from and wanted the very best here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's so many layers to this particular story. It's great. But I'd like to talk a little bit about the cultural landscape in the district, because, you know, we have graveyards, we have, we have green spaces, we have monuments, we have ornamental trees, and cultural landscapes often get missed as being important. And, uh, you know, we saw the challenge we had when uh, an annex was being proposed to be put on that burial ground. Um, and I just wondered if anyone, you know, had any experience with historic cultural landscapes and, you know, had any encouragement for us and, and any advice for us on that on that topic. Uh, Heather, this is Martha. Yes. Right. Can I comment here? Yes. Um, yeah, I, um, unfortunately, um, the dog who was barking at the beginning of this whole episode, uh, he, the attachment to the computer, so I missed half of it was all buzzing. However, uh, can you hear me? Oh, no, yes. perfect. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, what I would like to say is that the district, the built heritage, the landscape, and all the icons within the churches are incredibly important. And as you say, they're world-class. They're, um, uh, you know, you can go on and on. You've already talked about that and so has Rob. Um, however, you can't forget uh, the cemeteries and what is below the ground. And of course, that's my past, that's my history. That's what I studied is archeology. span and um, protecting these grave sites, uh, not only from development or, you know, yes, we can, under the Historic Resources Act, cap a site. You can put pavement over it, that's okay. However, do you want to do that in a cemetery and build over, um, graveyards, or, or sorry, uh, my apologies, burials that are from uh, Portugal, the Irish people, people from the 1600s and Catholics, whatever religious bent they had, are buried there. 
And, you know, I just really have a problem with having impact on any type of cemetery. And um, uh, I guess that's about it, what I have to say, but with your, with the built heritage and the cultural landscape, the cemeteries are a part of that and they are protected. And so they should be. And um, getting back to your point earlier and something else Rob said, which I absolutely love, the Canada voted to join us in 1949. I think that's brilliant. But um, we have to protect the cultural landscape. We have to protect the built heritage, the iconic glass, exact, you know, uh, but the cemeteries and the graveyards, they're not just graveyards. They're, you know, 400 plus years of the history of this province. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. Martha, what would a, what would a grave a burial been like back 300 years ago? I mean, we don't see a lot of headstones. What would you have encountered uh, in archaeological work in those graves? Well, it depends on where it was, of course. I mean, if you're looking, uh, you know, we have, we've investigated hundreds of uh, graveyards from the 1700s and on, and probably a couple from the 1600s. But basically what you're going to see is these little slate markers. Uh, but when you start to see the engraved uh, headstones, and that means money coming from England or Ireland to acknowledge the fact that someone important to their family has died. Uh, what we would see, you know, sometimes cemeteries uh, have the, in Harbor Grace with the Anglican Cathedral out there, um, yeah, there was a study done by a PhD student in archeology span that it's unbelievable what she found about people in that area, which is a boom town then in the 1700s. Their diet, um, you know, just everything about their lives. But I mean, I'm not talking about excavating uh, graves, but I'm talking no. about after my 30 years, it's just graveyards are so important to people from everywhere. Yeah. And, and would there be layers of, of people buried there in, in the burial ground in front of the Anglican Cathedral? In St. John's, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they were buried like five, six. We had one uh, episode where there was six coffins right on top of another. There were so many there. Wow. wow. Could I chime in here for a sec, everybody? Sure. Carry on. I think that the cemetery's uh, component is really, really important. Thank you. Um, no, for a variety of reasons. Thank you. That was fascinating again. And, you know, these are the things that, I mean, these are stories of lives lived, actual lives. People want to, when they're touring, they want to hear about how those people lived. Exactly. No, and they, they truly do. It's like a, it's a time portal for them, right? And if, if some of that lore, and not, not just lore, but knowledge could be shared, that would also be, to me, a very attractive, uh, compelling reason for people to want to visit the, the district. I just think it's fascinating, and I think other people do too. I know from experience, from, from what they tell me. And um, the fact that there were like five layers, what? Like, I mean, you know? But, uh, well, that's how, that's how, well, we, you had so many, uh, the, so many people from so many areas of the world uh, buried yeah. there of no, it didn't matter any denomination, they were buried there. I, there's a report that was done at the Harbor Grace Anglican Cathedral, where unfortunately a backhoe had uprooted a lot of the early uh, graves. But what they learned from that, from early Newfoundland uh, settlement, and it, it, it goes back to St. John's, 
uh, because uh, Harbor Grace was challenging St. John's for being the hub of the area during those days. And it's incredible what, um, um, I'm sorry, someone's calling me. I don't know how to turn that off. So would that uh, that study in Harbor Grace be of interest to us to kind of help interpret? Oh, it would, it would, it's brilliant. It, you know, it's an incredible study, but I think she was a PhD student. Okay. I, I can I can send you the link to it. She it was and she just showed the diet, how people lived, how they died, the broken bones, mm. the amount of uh, children who died during mm. that, the seventeen hundreds. It uh, like I say, I'm I'm not promoting that we should excavate cemeteries. All I'm saying is that cemeteries have people in them, and those people matter. And they come from in Newfoundland and Labrador. They come from all areas of the world. It's just not a local uh, issue when we're talking about the churches and the district. We're talking about uh, we're talking about a lifestyle that. Well, I don't know if everyone on this call or whatever it is knows, but you know, Newfoundland was a cosmopolitan area in the 60s, 1700s. People from all over the world were coming here to fish and to, you know, and they they died here, they were buried here. And I think, you know, that we have to show a lot of respect for other countries whose patriots have died here and were buried here. Yeah. Fascinating. I see, um, I see Ruth uh, Canning that you have your hand raised. Would you like to chime in with a question or a comment? Unmute. Ruth, I think Ruth, you're muted there, Ruth. Can you unmute Ruth? <laughs> um, just while we're waiting for that, I also see that there's a comment in the chat from Ian. Can you um, hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Here okay. You so thank you. Uh, there, there is a God because I, he got me unmuted. Um, Martha, this is a fa uh, absolutely fascinating component of the ecclesiastical district of which I'm very familiar. I'm, I'm most fam familiar with the built um, architecture, which is stunning, which is uh, so comparative to Quebec City, for example, on a par with or greater than Quebec City, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But the cemeteries are a whole different story. The buildings we can see visually, uh, and it's sort of an easier component. What's under the ground, we don't have a clue about. Most of us don't, okay? Now, one, one and, and I, I understand there's four or five cemeteries within the district. Is that correct, John? How many cemeteries within the ecclesiastical district? Well, we started with the Anglican Cemetery. Then yeah. we saw the old Catholic burial ground. Yeah. We put up the picture of Belvedere Cemetery. We yeah. put up the Nun Cemetery, but we forgot that it next door to the Kirk, in their, under their sort of, the, uh, uh, Kirk, excuse me, Gower Street United, uh, under where they park and where the police, you, you know, the police Bobby and the bronze statue yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the old, if I'm not mistaken, Rob and Rob can speak to that. The Methodist Cemetery. Yeah, well, that was my question, John. Exactly. Yeah. Rob, Rob, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, Rob, um, yeah. I, uh, I, I so know so little. I mean, Gower United is a stunning piece of architecture, but I know nothing about the cemetery. And this, that was going to be my question. Where is it exactly? How old is it? Who was buried there? What can you tell us about that? Uh, not not a great deal. Um, a lot of the, the records seem to have been lost, but I can send you a map, uh, old, uh, a map from the 19th century that shows the location, and it appears to be uh, immediately to the uh, to the west of the uh, current building. Now, uh, the the gower that's there today was built in uh, consecrated in 1896. Uh, and then a memorial building was built a few decades later to the west. That's a square-ish building attached. Um, and it may have been under that building or possibly in that sort of traffic 
island uh, to the to the west, or perhaps both those areas. And there's one more cemetery as well, actually, Jen, and it's the old Fort Townsend Fort Cemetery, the military cemetery, which is directly in front of the Archbishop's Palace, where Anne was showing you those gates in the video. Those trees, all those big trees, they're on top of the old Fort Townsend Cemetery, which went from 1775 up until about 1810, 11, 15, whenever. Um, we don't know the extent of burials there. It should be possible to find out if we were to consult the, the Board of Ordnance records and, and some other things. But there are some very substantial resources in terms of cemeteries there. And I bet you there are some substantial historical resources to sort of document some of these things. We have yet to scratch the surface, which is why I think Martha's comments are, yep. are entirely spot on. And, 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 and I think what I'm hearing is that... Um, what's contained in these early burial grounds, the Anglican and the Catholic, are really linked to this international story. And we have real yeah. tangible resource here, uh, human remains that are linked to this international fishery and the international economy, which is really a critical piece as we go forward to, uh, to you know, to the world, uh, to a, with a world heritage application. The other thing is that we're probably one of the oldest living heritage landscapes in, in North America. I mean, you know, we know we're at least 1699, if not earlier. And, you know, we're still living in the same function that we started with. And uh, that, that's very exciting. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, European-wise, you're cor totally correct. Yes. I just see a couple um, a couple comments in the chat there. So one from Ian, who's just going back to the Kirk. Um, he's wondering if anyone knows who owns the land um, next to the Kirk, whether the old Holloway School, where the old Holloway School was. Um, is it it's the Kirk, the city, a private owner, et cetera? Anyone know the answer to that one? Yes, uh, Dean McDonald owns the old Holloway School site. Um, I see another comment there as well um, from Kong who says, I suppose there's a lack of uh, physicality or attachment when it comes to the cemeteries on the church ground as they are buried under all that soil and gravel. In the future, could we expect some certain level of restoration of the cemeteries, even repurposing them as recreational spaces or city parks? Well, look at the, I mean, Ruth can, can talk about the old burial ground in Halifax where these things have all been done. Uh, so you interpret, you preserve what you can. Um, I mean, with, with some minimal archaeology, I expect uh, it'd be interesting to hear what Martha would say about this, but I, I'd be willing to bet you there's probably some headstones just below the surface down there. Um, Robert Sweeney, the historian at Memorial who won the Governor General's Award a few years ago, uh, Robert has written a brilliant uh, a sort of analysis of of that cemetery and gave a really good paper on the Anglican Cathedral Cemetery and says, look, this is the largest, earliest working class cemetery in North America related to the pursuit of the prosecution of the international cod fishery. And mm -hmm. this, is, this is a major, major historically important site that testifies to those transatlantic migrations and that fishery. And that's a you know, just, just stop and think for a second. Our coast, our waters, our fish were the principal source of protein for Europe for 400 years. There's no source of food on this planet in the last 2000 years that can match that. And it came from here and the people who did it are buried there. And this is, yes, this does testify to a major period of expansion and a major movement of peoples um, from, from east to west and a major economic, a social, cultural um, set of changes that in fact changed the planet forever. I mean, good and bad, but um, let's face it, what these people brought to North America um, were, wasn't just a fishery and an economy, it was their culture and their their customs, their, their habits, and they built the churches, they built the communities, and they, they predated the institutions of state. There was no, 
You can read John Reeves' History of the Government of the Island of, of Newfoundland, 1792. That was the year of our first government institution, the Supreme Court of Newfoundland. Predated the Executive Council, predated the House of Assembly, predated all the other stuff, the, the courts, the, the whole works. Reeves, 1792, and we had an Anglican parish, and we had churches operating, um, Christian churches operating throughout Newfoundland and Labrador in throughout the 1700s and into the back 1600s. So this district is of enormous historical and cultural importance. I think actually we need a full, if I could say it, I'd love to, I'd love to see the funds for it. And I'd love to have someone like Martha advising us. This needs a full archaeological study because we, we haven't even scratched the surface. So to answer Kong's question, I'd say, yeah, there's room for all the above there, and including, including the scholarship, because just imagine what that would do, Jen, to, to our awareness and the way we think of ourselves as a community and, and, and how we, um, how we envision, the, envision the importance of these resources to our community, right? Uh, John? Yeah. Very well said. It's so nice to see you. It really is. Great, great to hear you. I wish I could see you there. <laughs> well, well, it's too bad, but whatever. Um, I, you know what? With respect to uh, your first point earlier, with uh, you know, uh, you know, putting playgrounds over graveyards or, or whatever, um, it really. That would not be a problem archaeologically as long as there was no intrusion, of course, down into the graves. However, uh, you'd have to have community buy-in. Yeah. We, we, we couldn't, I mean, when I was, I'm retired now, as you know, so, um, but if, um, if you can cap a site under the legislation, that's okay. But what I've learned over 30 odd years with government is that you have to have community buy-in. I can cite the legislation and say, well, yeah, no problem. Just pave over that area. Yeah. But which, you know, which whatever, but you know what I mean? And, uh, but you have to, if you're going to have a park, that's a different thing. Children playing, um you're grassing it over and you're interpreting the site mm. or people who are buried there yeah you don't need i mean the world is you know reaching a point with burials that it's taking up a lot of ground so i think we have to reevaluate how we look at grave sites in some aspects and i'm not talking about what we're talking about the district we're talking about I'm talking about, you know, uh, other areas that a community may want to, okay, we know uh, people were buried here, but, you know, we would like to create this little park. And, you know, if there's community buy-in, that's fine. But when we're talking about uh, St. John's and getting back to world history and the historical, the international importance of the grave sites here um only my opinion um one has to be very very careful uh, because you're true. talking international you're talking yeah. about people from all over the world that's right that are buried there that's right i'll give you a practical example too and how our evaluation of this changes and our sense of value in 1995 a neighbor of mine um th their daughter got married and uh, we were getting ready to go to the wedding and her uncle, the whole, all the neighborhood were all going to the wedding over at St. James United. And her uncle came to the house and dumped on the front doorstep of my house, a Dominion bag, a plastic bag with three iron cannonballs in it. Cool. And he said, what are they? He knew what they were. And I said, they're cannonballs. And I said, um, where'd you get them? Well, his wife was the daughter of a gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Albert Whalen. And uh, he and his wife had a trailer in Cupid's, and which is where the family is from. 
And it turns out, Mr. and it was on Mr. Whalen's land, their trailer. And Mr. Whalen, it turns out his cabbage patch was right on top of what is now the cemetery of John Guy's plantation, the Sea Forest plantation that Bill Gilbert excavated. There okay. you go. There and, you go. Wow. Right. So he put the spade down in the ground to dig up potatoes and he started hitting cannonballs and he started hitting headstones. Mm. And Bill was up digging up in the back by, by Cupid's Pond. And before too long, Bill was down digging in, in, in Ruth and Garland's um, a potato patch. Yeah, and, I'm there. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you know the rest of the story, Martha. But the point is, the point is, what we understand to be important and valuable changes is when we learn things, doesn't it? Right? Mm. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying cave everything over and cap it off, but I, I actually think culturally um, and socially and historically, we actually stand to learn a lot more um, from, from doing these kinds of things, uh, this kind of research and this archaeology than we do from, from, from in fact, creating playgrounds. And it'll be worth more, more to our cultural and tourism industries. I well, agree. Yeah. And another thing, to, oh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can no, I no, say, no, okay. No, 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 no. Uh, getting back to built heritage, if we look down archeologically and we go down into the builder's trenches, mm -hmm. whether it be the cathedral or a church or any building, in St. John, you find a lot in those trenches. You'll find the pipe stems. You'll find things that you can date back to, uh, you know, a certain time period, if you have enough. And generally, there's enough pipe stems. They must have smoked a lot in those days. <laughs> but they're there. And, you know, if you have enough, you can pretty well tighten down the date. And um, but there's also a lot of other things you find in the builder's trenches. That's just around historic buildings. So what I'm saying is archaeology is not just about graveyards or digging up Aboriginal sites or, you know, Cupids or Fairyland. It's, it's also about, like, you know, looking at the basis of foundations. If a building is coming down to St. John's, when I was there, and I, I, I'm assuming they're still doing the same thing, uh, you know, any building that comes down to St. John's, if they're going below grade, then you want to uh, have a look at it archaeologically. Why? Because, like I say, the builder's trenches can provide so much information. Um, and a churchyard, well... I mean, you can imagine what a churchyard will provide, what information. Um, so never so, forget uh, archaeology. Uh, so I don't want to prolong this, but it's, it seems to me that the archaeological assessment that's going to be required with the demolition of the parish hall, um, you know, to accommodate those townhouses is going to be a very important piece of work. You're asking me? Yes, of course it is. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's good, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's not just the building itself. You take away the building, you gotta look at the foundation, you gotta look at the builder's trenches and what's below it. I mean, how deep is the building or the basement, if there is one, uh, who knows what's below it? You never know what's below the ground. No. Yeah. Well, folks, I'm cognizant of time, I think, with three minutes to spare. Um, I just want to toss it back to our, our wonderful panelists, Heather, Rob, and John, for any kind of last words that you'd like to share with the group before we clue up. Well, uh, I see Ruth has her hand up. Could we just have her in and then we'll we'll say goodnight? <laughs> so, okay. That might be from before, but Ruth, if you have another comment, feel free to chime in. She's coming out of Rodney Law. Oh, okay. Well, I guess uh, I think, you know, we're delighted to be able to do this tonight and for people to have participated and that we will, this will be on your website now for people who, uh, you know, who go to your website and, and we will get some views there. 
And so, you know, what's happening in the city now is really important. Uh, the city has uh, proposed some new heritage bylaws, which is going to allow for the first time new construction and tall buildings in our heritage district, which is gonna change the shape of and the view and uh, the authenticity and the integrity of our heritage districts, including this one. So, you know, people need to be aware that this is happening. They're gonna allow modern architecture and uh, it's, it's going to fundamentally visually change. We're not going to have heritage districts anymore. We're going to have just heritage buildings here and there. So people need to be aware of this. They need to be speaking to their counselors, especially people in the downtown, uh, when uh, you know unlimited uh, tall buildings are gonna be permitted uh, to be built uh, in all these neighborhoods. And in such a way that the, the city council is uh, in their bylaws are going to allow this to happen without any public input. So we're at a really critical uh, time, not just for the district, but for our significant heritage areas, heritage area one. So encourage people to get involved and to reach out to their counselors. But I, I think it's great uh, we get to share this. And I think thank you to everyone who's participated tonight. Jen, you know, the World Heritage um, qualification is, is pretty stringent. One of the things that require is that the municipality, the city, province will, will protect, will undertake to protect the heritage of the site that's being given World Heritage status. And that means no high rise construction in the middle of a World Heritage District or what could be one. So, you know, I, I don't wanna to put too sharp a point on it, but the city has a question facing it right now. And that is, do we want a high rise condo tower or do we want a World Heritage site? And it's almost like, you know, do you want a playground or do you, do you want an interpreted cemetery? Do you, want, do, you want, do you want heritage interpretation and do you want tourism and do you want other things or do you want to do you want to give the benefits entirely to one developer who will build a, a, a ten story building? John, um, excuse me. A any way to put this question out on like uh, somehow either for the news that you know they ask questions of the day, for example, right? To put it out somewhere to get what the public feels about this, not just in town but in the whole province. It'd be interesting. I'd be interested as to how, what people have to say about it. I I suspect you're going to hear more about this. <laughs> if these folks had anything to do with it, I'm sure you will. <laughs> Rob, Rob was there going to say something. Else. I was just going to say you're you're quite right. It is not just we can't just think of this as a uh, uh, you know the, the ecclesiastical district neighborhood interest or even the city interest. That it's a provincial interest, and mm. uh, you know by by some of the things we were talking about tonight uh, in its relationship to at least the the European. Uh, settlement of North America, uh, important uh, way, way beyond our, our shores. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of preserving this area, I sh should just note, of course, that there are national standards, uh, heritage standards uh, that the city has chosen not to adopt, which would go a long way to protecting what we are trying to protect and preserving it, uh, you know, not just for at, you know, the tourism post COVID, but for uh, the generations to come. We're, we're just the custodians at the moment of, of this past and we wanna pass it on intact to the future. Thank, okay. Thanks, I very much enjoyed participating in the comments I've heard here tonight and thanks. the chance to make my own. Thanks so much, Rob. I just see one more comment um, in the chat from Ian. Um, who said, uh, yeah, maybe it's too late to ask, is phase three happening for sure, which is the high rise next to the Kirk? And yeah. I see, sorry, go ahead, Heather. Yeah, yes, it is. Um, obviously, the developer is going to be focusing on the townhouses on Queen's Road, but the city has given him approval in principle to proceed and with what's called a site-specific uh, zone and that site specific zone will allow high density and will allow up to the 10 stories. Um, so uh, if people are concerned and we hope they are, uh, that this will, you know, fundamentally change our district, it will eliminate our ability if they proceed with the design as is for us to go forward with World Heritage, please reach out to, to your counselor and, and be concerned about what's going to happen in your own neighborhood because here today, it's going to be on another street in our downtown tomorrow, so. Great. 
Um, yeah. Well, thanks so much, uh, Heather, Rob, and John, specifically for being here this evening, for giving up so much of your time and creating that beautiful video. Um, we will certainly share an edited version of this conversation, including the Q&A um, on our Facebook page. Um, but a huge thank you to the three of you and thanks to everyone who joined us this evening. This was a fantastic conversation and what a way to spend a Tuesday night. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, now. Folks. See ya. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.